Thank you, Seth, and good morning. Good to see all of you here. If you're visiting, we are in the book of Joshua. We have recently begun a series in it. We're in chapter 5 this morning, and we're going to look at the entire chapter. I'll read it all in just a moment, but to give you a little background, you remember, if if you've been coming, that Israel has come into the land. The Lord brought them into Canaan in a miraculous way. He divided the Jordan River, backed it up, and they crossed over on dry land into the promised land. And so they are there as we come to chapter 5. This miraculous entrance into the land has occurred and it affected those who are dwelling in the land, the Canaanites. We begin the chapter with that. Now it came about when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed, that their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. So Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Ha'ar Aloth. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males... All the men of war died in the wilderness along the way after they came out of Egypt. For all the people came out, who came out were circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. So just as a, a moment of explanation, as verse 2 ends, that they were to circumcise the sons of Israel a sec- the second time, that probably means because the generation pri- previously left Egypt circumcised, and the nation that entered in, this new generation, was not circumcised, this is the second time the nation will be circumcised. Verse 6, well, The sons of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until the nation that is, the men of war who came out of Egypt perished because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord had sworn that He would not let them see the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. The children whom He raised up in their place, Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them along the way. Now, when they had finished circumcising all the nation, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna. But they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, No. Rather, I indeed come as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down 
and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? The captain of the Lord of hosts, of the Lord's hosts, said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Well, that, you sang that well. It seemed like it was going to be a very complicated hymn, but uh, you all led us very well. It's a beautiful hymn and very appropriate for our study. The Lord is our salvation, and that's really what the name Joshua means. The Lord saves, the Lord is salvation. There is uh, an ancient Latin adage that translates, if you want peace, prepare for war. But how does a nation do that? Well, the suggestion of the saying is the best way to ensure peace is to be well armed and ready for conflict. But what does a nation do when it's not well armed and war comes. Winston Churchill used rhetoric. When he became prime minister, England was not prepared to fight Hitler. So he spoke to the House of Commons honestly and inspirationally. He said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And it worked. It electrified Parliament and the nation. Joshua prepared Israel in a different way from all of these. He prepared the nation spiritually. He told the people to consecrate themselves for conquest. And that's the lesson for us as well. Christians live in a spiritual war daily, continually. Sometimes it may seem to let up, but it never really does. We need to be armed with the Word of God. Scripture is our sword, but we won't use it well if we're not dedicated to Christ. If we are to conquer, we must be, first of all, consecrated. We must set ourselves apart daily for that task, just as Israel did when they entered the land of Canaan. So we learn a lot from this passage. The land had already been prepared by the Lord for conquest. Chapter 5 begins with that in the first verse with a description of the effect that the miraculous crossing of the Jordan had on the kings of Canaan. They knew a miracle had occurred and probably thought of Egypt's demise when the Lord parted the Red Sea. And so we're told their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer. They had no will to fight. Yet, they also would not remedy their situation by repenting and believing in the Lord as Rahab had done. It's a witness to the the hardness of the human heart. Even when... He has clear, given clear light, and, and when man has a clear light of revelation, he does not yield. He digs in his heels even more and resists. It's natural that he do that. That is the response of the natural man, the unregenerate heart. And that's the picture we have here. The kings of Canaan were in mortal dread of the Lord and His power. They, they knew from the facts and history that they were doomed, still they didn't repent and seek mercy. Ignorance was no excuse. They had the same revelation that Rahab had. She turned to the Lord, as did it seem her family. And the Lord was patient with them, that He was patient with the Amorites and the Canaanites. After telling Abraham that Israel would inherit the land, He waited until the fourth generation. That's what he told Abraham he was going to do some 500 years. 
And yet they only increased in their sinfulness. But now his patience had run out, and in righteousness, with justice, he would judge the people of the land and give Canaan to his people. It was time for the conquest. But verses 2 and 3 indicate that Israel was not yet ready for the conquest. And so, just when we might expect the order to be given to go forward and conquer, the Lord says, in effect, wait. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. So Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Ha'aroloth. Circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. It signified membership in that covenant and in the nation of the covenant. Without it, there was no participation in national blessings. The, no participation in the promises of the covenant. In fact, in Genesis 17, verse 14, when the Lord gave this right to Abraham, He said to him that anyone who is not circumcised shall be cut off from his people. Very serious. So it's surprising to find that the nation had entered the land uncircumcised. But as verses 4 and 5 explain, during the 40 years of wilderness wandering, the practice of circumcision had not been carried out. Now the reason isn't revealed, but according to verse 6, it was in connection with the judgment of God on the nation because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord. It's the sin at uh, Kadesh Barnea that is referred to there when the people refused to enter the land because of a bad report by ten of the twelve spies. They, you remember, feared the giants and they didn't believe the Lord's promise. They didn't believe that He could overcome those obstacles of huge city walls and giants and all these frightful things that they saw that He wasn't sufficient for that and wouldn't keep His word. So... As a consequence, they wandered until that unfaithful generation died off. And it's thought that since that generation was under judgment, it could not apply the sign of the covenant to its sons. And so because of judgment, the practice of circumcision was suspended. When the fathers all died, the judgment was lifted. But the new generation needed the sign before it could conquer the land. So God commanded Joshua to make knives of flint and circumcise the men. Now that was was risky and unconventional. The, The smart strategy, what one would expect, would be following this miraculous entrance into the land and the terror that had come upon the Canaanites and the Amorites, was strike immediately. Strike while the iron is hot. That's conventional wisdom. But this decision, this procedure, left the nation defenseless. Circumcision is surgery and incapacitating. Genesis 34 illustrates that with the slaughter of the men of Shechem by Levi and Simeon after those men in the city had been circumcised. I won't go into the story, you can read it, but the two brothers used circumcision circumcision as a ruse to make the men of Shechem vulnerable to their vengeance. Well, now God had commanded Joshua to make his people vulnerable, make his people incapable of fighting or defending themselves for a number of days. And he had delayed the battle all for the sake of circumcision. Which might seem very odd. It would have to the Canaanites. But God doesn't do things the way we do them. He's not in a hurry like we are in a hurry. We need to learn that. 
We need to learn that because to enjoy His blessings, we must move at His pace according to His leading, according to His will. And that may involve waiting. It's a hard thing for people to do, to wait upon the Lord. We want to act immediately. But we need to wait. We need to wait on providence. And before we can enjoy His blessing, we must be right with Him. There, there must be obedience to God. There must be consecration that is not just Old Testament theology and ethics, that's New Testament as well. In fact, Jesus said in, in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And that's what this is about. Showing love, obedience, devotion to the Lord by keeping His commandments. And it was urgent that they do that. There's a strange incident in Exodus 4 that illustrates the urgency Moses was going back to Egypt from Midian to begin this great ministry that he would have as the lawgiver and as the, the, the one who would lead them out of slavery when the Lord almost put him to death. Almost slew Moses. And what saved him was his wife Zipporah who took a flint and circumcised Moses' son then scolded Moses. She called him a bridegroom of blood. Well, it shows the importance of circumcision under the Old Covenant. Moses had failed to do that. Moses had failed to perform, perform that very basic, that very important rite on his son. And he almost died as a consequence. So before this people could possess the land, they had to be obedient to God's Word and carry out the sign of the covenant by being circumcised. They had to consecrate themselves. Consecration is about dedication. And circumcision signified that. It, it showed they belonged to God. By cutting away the flesh, they showed they were separated from the flesh and the world spiritually. It's an outward sign, but a sign that, that has an inward reality. Inner separation the inner purification that is necessary for a life of obedience and love to God. Now that's the meaning of it. Circumcision in and of itself means nothing. It does nothing. It's a sign, and it reminded them of what they, what they are and what they were to be. So its main meaning was spiritual. And I think that's clear from the law itself, because in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, Moses said to the people, Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. That's the meaning of this physical rite. It, 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 what it's saying, in other words, and what Moses is saying, and what that rite of circumcision indicates is, they were to live inwardly according to the outward sign. We're to do the same. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul wrote that we as Christians have been circumcised in Christ. He wrote, in Him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, so it's a spiritual thing, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And what that is referring to is the cross and what Christ accomplished at the cross. Christ bought us at the cross through the shedding of His blood, the rending of His flesh, bought us out of the world. We are separated from our old life and separated to Christ. And at that moment of faith, that becomes real. That, that reality is applied to us. What was bought for us at the cross 2,000 years ago is applied to us today at the moment of faith. And it becomes real to us. We actually become spiritually new creatures, a new creation. So we're to live as a new creation. We're to live that way. As Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, cut off from the flesh as it were, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Realize it is so and live it. 
And Paul goes on to say in verse 13, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments, or that can be translated weapons of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments or weapons of righteousness to God. That's consecration. And that is pictured here. It's preparation for war. After this, they remained in camp to heal and named the place Gilgal, meaning rolling. Because in verse 9, the Lord said, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Now this expression, the reproach of Egypt, has been explained in, in various ways, so there's not a lot of certainty on what it means or what it refers to, but one of the most common explanations is it refers to the slander that came out of Egypt while Israel was under discipline in the desert. When the Egyptians learned that the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness, they concluded that God had abandoned them and began slandering them because of it. But with this national circumcision, that slander had been silenced. They were in the land and consecrated to God in a right relationship with Him. That may be the meaning. Some have suggested it's something else. It's having come into the land and now officially been brought into the Abrahamic covenant. They are no longer slaves. They are now freemen. And the the slander of slavery has been removed. Either way, they are in a new relationship and the world's slander has been silenced. But circumcision was not all that was necessary. They also had to celebrate the Passover. That too was commanded of them. It it was the date on the calendar for that feast. And so we read in verse 10... While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. This was the third celebration of the Passover recorded in the Bible. The first was in Egypt before their deliverance, the day before they were to leave. And then the second was at Mount Sinai referred to in Numbers chapter 9. Now it's not clear that the nation observed the Passover while wandering in the wilderness. There's no other record of it other than Numbers chapter 9. And it would seem from the condition we know of the nation not having circumcised their sons that perhaps they weren't observing the Passover during all that time, which would tell us how much of a spiritual desert Israel was in while wandering in that physical desert for 40 years. But here the people celebrated. The timing was significant. The the first Passover happened just before they left Egypt, just before they came out of slavery. And this Passover was celebrated just after they entered the land. Just after the wilderness wanderings have now ended. And they are before their great inheritance. And as the people ate and remembered the Lord and how He brought them out of slavery with a mighty hand, it would confirm His promise to bring them in and give them possession of all that they saw before them by that same mighty hand. He's faithful, and that would be the reminder to them. He keeps His word always. So the nation camped on the plains of Jericho. In physical weakness, they celebrated the Passover, but they celebrated it in safety because the Lord was with them and was keeping their enemies away, keeping them in fear and inactive. Well, that's the assurance that we have as we trust in Him and obey His Word. It, again, was an odd command to give It was an odd thing to occur. We would expect, cross the Jordan, go to Jericho, and fight and conquer. But now they're incapacitated. 
But that's the obedience that they were giving to the Lord. And as we do that, as we live in obedience against what may seem to be common sense, but it's what the Word of God teaches us to do in a particular situation, we can know this, that He will provide for us as we are obedient. He provides protection and everything we need. And we see that here. As they ate the Passover before the city of Jericho, it was something like Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Those are more than just beautiful words and sentiment. They mean something. They're true. They and other promises like them are assurances of God's help when we walk with Him. He's always faithful. Always faithful. The encouragement to trust Him was also reinforced in the next event. While He fed them the Passover, He stopped feeding them the manna that they had eaten for 40 years. Verse 11. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. The point is, Israel had arrived. The wilderness wanderings had ended, and this marked a new beginning for the nation. God's special providence that was necessary to bring them into the promised land ended when the promise was fulfilled. It was no longer necessary. And the fact that they ate some of the produce of the land in their Passover meal and after was, again, proof of God's faithfulness and the reliability of His promises. It, it was clear, a, a clear symbol that they had taken possession of the land. Uh, go back into Moses' instruction, which he gave before they entered the land, after the 40 years of wandering, and in, it says in one of his sermons in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 11, he promised that God promised to give them a rich land with houses filled with all kinds of good things that they didn't provide. So he's giving them a land that they didn't cultivate, giving them houses they didn't build, giving them many things. And he lists the good things that the Lord would give to them, or the Lord lists them. Wells you did not dig, and vineyards, and olive groves you did not plant. And now here Israel is eating from a harvest that they didn't plant. All through the Bible, we are instructed to walk by faith. Old Testament and New Testament alike. We are taught to walk by faith as those great saints did in the Old Testament. To live by trusting the Lord day by day, knowing that He will provide and bless and will do that because He is sovereign over all of the earth and He is faithful to His promises and faithful to His people, faithful to supply us. It's the instruction of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 3. I love this verse. It's so New Testament in its theology, but it's, it's biblical in its theology. This is the word of the Lord. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Old Testament and New Testament alike. That's how the Christian lives. Not by power. It's not by the might of armies that, that Israel would, would conquer but by the power of the Lord. And it's how we overcome as well. What we need to do is be faithful and follow Him. He will prepare our way, fight our battles, and give us victory. That's the assurance of, that's given in the next verses, verses 13 through 15. Consecration to God is necessary for blessing. But we also need to be led into those blessings by the Lord Himself and submit to His leading. 
And Joshua now meets his captain he was to follow. He had not been given any direct instruction on how to conquer and capture Jericho. And so being a general, he went out to survey the city and, and develop a strategy. He must have, must have been a little puzzled as he looked at the walls of Jericho as one of those cities that, the, uh, that were large and fortified to heaven as those uh, spies reported 38 years earlier. We can't conquer this. They have massive walls and giants that live there. Well, its walls did seem invincible, and the only weapons the Israelites had were swords and slings and arrows and spears, and arrows and spears just bounce off walls. And so Joshua was pondering a strategy that would be successful. Success was necessary because Jericho was the gateway to Cana. To enter the land, they had to go through Jericho. While he was thinking about the battle, he was surprised to look up and see a soldier standing there with his sword drawn. Not knowing who the man was, whether he was friend or foe, Joshua went to him ready to, to fight if necessary and asked, are you for us or for our adversaries? Literally, it is, are, are you ours or our foes? And the answer Joshua was given made it clear that uh, he was no human warrior. No, he said, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. The answer no is a bit cryptic, mysterious, but it was a way of, of correcting the question that was asked. It's never a question of whether God is on our side. God is sovereign. The question is, are we on God's side? His sovereignty is indicated in the word, the host. We get an idea of what the host of the Lord is from various passages in the Old Testament. In 1 Kings 22, when where Micaiah the prophet told King Ahab of his vision. He revealed that he saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him. That's the army of the Lord, the host of heaven, myriads and myriads of angelic beings, millions and millions of these powerful angels. Or 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, when Elijah and his servant were in Dothan, surrounded by the Syrian army, and unseen to them was the Lord's host surrounding them. Mount, the mountain was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Here, suddenly Joshua's eyes were opened. He, he knew the stranger was no man and fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? It's not clear that Joshua realized he was seeing a theophany. Clearly, he knew he was seeing something supernatural, but not altogether clear that at this moment he understood it was an appearance of God, specifically the pre incarnate Christ, because he calls him Adonai, Lord, not Yahweh, Jehovah. But it's clear he was seeing a theophany from what follows, verse. 15, the captain of the Lord of hosts said to Joshua, remove your sandals for, from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. That is almost word for word the command that the Lord gave Moses when he appeared to him at, in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 5. Angels don't call for worship. When men fall down before angels, they tell them to get up. Don't worship me. This one received the worship because this was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came with sword drawn to indicate that it was time for battle and that he had come with his heavenly army to make war on the Canaanites and give the land to Israel. Just as the Lord had encouraged Moses with the words, I will be with you, he would do the same for Joshua. 
That indicates the nature of the conflict. It would be physical with swords and spears, but also spiritual uh, and chiefly spiritual. It would be a war fought uh, on two levels and, and the Lord would ensure Israel's victory. He would be in the vanguard of every battle, leading the Lord's army. His host in an invisible war against the material armies of Canaan. He would always be there. Unseen, but real. And it's the same for us. Paul reminds us of that in Ephesians chapter 6, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Paul wasn't suggesting that uh, there is no materialism in our struggle in this world. There is, of course. History proves that. Early Christians were covered in pitch and made into torches to light Nero's garden. And Christians across the Roman Empire were thrown to the lions. And it's not just ancient history. Christians are suffering across the globe. Right now, there's a bloody persecution of Christians by Muslims in Nigeria, though it's hardly reported on. So it, it is physical. It is material. But the greater battle, the one that, that energizes the one that we see around us, is spiritual and unseen. Just as it was with Job when he was physically and emotionally and spiritually afflicted by Satan. Well, that's what Paul means when he says that our war is against the rulers, the powers, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We fight really on three fronts. We fight, we, we fight against three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And often it's, it's difficult to tell them apart, which shows how deceptive and how pervasive this spiritual conflict is. It is within us and it is around us. And no one is sufficient for it, not in and of ourselves. To withstand the enemy, Paul gives us a sense of, of the strength of that and the, and the difficulty of withstanding the enemy of the struggle in various passages in, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17 and in Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. Our war is between the flesh and the spirit. It's between the, the, the flesh and the human spirit. That's in Romans 7. And between the flesh and the Holy Spirit in the book of Galatians. It's an inner struggle in which Paul found himself doing the very thing that he didn't want to do, doing the very thing that he hated. And it reminds us from the apostles' experience, and I think we know it from our own experience, that, that while we are new creatures, we are a new creation, we are still subject to temptation and sin. We began with the question, how does a nation prepare for war? The church is in a more deadly struggle than any national or global hot war. How do we prepare for it? The book of Hebrews gives direction. In chapter 12, the author tells us, lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race set before us. But there's a specific way to run. Uh, to live each moment, and that is fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And that word author can mean leader or captain. Follow the captain. Do not take your eyes off of him. Do not take your eyes off the leader or you will get out of your lane and you will trip, you will fall. So keep your eyes on him. That, that's essentially the instruction the Lord gave to Joshua here. Lay aside every encumbrance and sin by consecrating yourselves to the Lord and His life and His service. Put aside whatever interferes with that. At the same time, we're to fill our minds with Christ, who He is and what He's done. In fact, I think as we do that, we do lay aside these things. 
We do naturally put them away as we see the beauty of Christ and the glory of Christ and we contemplate who He is and what He's done as the eternal Son of God become man and our Savior. As we fill our minds with that revelation with the Scriptures, we do lay aside these things. We want to. It's through the Scriptures that we, we learn of Him. It's through the Scriptures that we grow in our relationship with Him and through prayer, as well as study. These are the vital tools of faith. These are the vital things that we need to be giving our attention to. Satan is always trying to destroy the church. He'll use whatever means is most effective. He may use physical means, as he has down through history, and as he is using, as I said. And maybe someday soon that will be the case with us. We'll face physical harm, physical persecution. But Often in the West, it, it, it's not the physical persecution that we face. Christians are faced with something else, and that is distractions. I think that's one of Satan's chief tools to get us off the mark, as it were, off the Scriptures, off of Christ, of taking our eyes off Him and putting them on other things. C.S. Lewis gave a good illustration of that in his screw tape letters. He wrote that during the Second World War, as published in 1942. And in the early chapters of the screw tape letters, the master demon, Screw Tape, tells his understudy, Wormwood, how to undermine the spiritual life of the Christian that he had been assigned to. In one chapter, he told him to keep him from praying. In another, it was to distract him. Make him either an extreme patriot or an extreme pacifist. It didn't matter which one. All extremes except devotion to the enemy are to be encouraged. In other words, distract him from, with some urgent issue to keep him away from the essential issue, Christ himself. Look, politics is important, and we need to vote. It's a God-given right that we have. It's a privilege. We need to do that. But never become distracted by politics. Uh, the Lord is in control, and we need to always keep our eyes focused on Him. I got a message last night from our friend in the north in Oklahoma, Mr. Black. And he evidently got this from someone as well. It's nicely printed out. But the message is, during the next 28 days, and I, now it's, what, 16 days, please don't let the elephants and the donkeys make you forget you belong to the Lamb. That's a good point. That's who we belong to, and that's who we're to keep our eyes focused upon. We're to keep our eyes on Christ. He is our captain. That's how the author describes him in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, and then again in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. The author of our salvation, or the captain of our salvation. He is our captain because he won the victory for his people at the cross, where he purchased us for himself and for eternal life and defeated the devil. Satan's already defeated. Believers are assured of ultimate victory. So we are to follow our captain as he leads us through this world on our march to heaven, fighting along the way, not yielding to distractions and temptations. We're assured of ultimate victory. We never should despair. We are assured of victory, just as Israel was assured that they would enter the land, and they did. In May 1940, when Churchill gave his speech to the House of Commons and said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, he was asking for their support of him and his government. The German army was the greatest army in the world. It was unstoppable. But the nation put its hope in Churchill, even though there was no reason to believe that England could hold out against the Third Reich. 
How much more should we put our confidence in our captain? Consecrate ourselves to him. Lay aside the encumbrances. Not get distracted from the scriptures and follow Christ daily. That's the way we overcome the enemy. That's the way we grow. But first, we must be circumcised spiritually with the circumcision of the heart being cut off from the old life and set apart to God. It's what Christ did at the cross for all who believe in Him when He suffered death and judgment for us. So believe in Him if you have not. Trust in Christ if you have not done that. Be made new and then live that new life. Dedicate yourself to the Savior and consecrate yourself to conquest, to a life of service. That's the good life. And that's the life of eternal reward. God help us all to do that. Let's close in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless this supper that we are about to take. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for the example we have in this text of Israel and Your faithfulness to them of the rite that they went through and the Passover that they celebrated. It all speaks to us of the spiritual reality that we have entered into through faith in Christ. And Lord, may we be dedicated to You, to our great triune God, and serve You faithfully. May we understand that we are in a conflict constantly. These are serious times. This is always, it's always for the Christian a serious time. And help us to take it that way and dedicate ourselves to You. We pray these things in Christ's name. And pray your blessing upon us now as we take the Lord's Supper. May it be what it is intended to be, a reminder to us of all that we have in Christ, what He has done for us at such great cost, and who we now are because of Him through faith and faith alone. We thank You for Him. We thank You for Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to this Lord's Supper service. I'd uh, like to make a few comments about what it means that Jesus took our place, and then I'll give thanks for the bread. In 1 Peter 3, verse 18, we read, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. On the cross... Jesus took the punishment we deserved for our sins. He did not deserve to die, but he willingly took our place and experienced death for us. Jesus' death was the substitution, the just for the unjust, the innocent for the guilty, the perfect for the corrupt. The doctrine of substitutionary atonement teaches that Christ suffered vicariously, being substituted for the sinner and that his sufferings were an atonement for men. On the cross, Jesus took our place in several ways. Jesus took our place in that he was made sin for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, our sins were placed on him. The perfect Son of Man carried our guilt. Jesus also took our place in that he experienced physical death. Not just any death, but the death of a lawbreaker. Everyone dies, but there is a difference between dying a natural death and being executed for one's crimes. Sin is the violation of God's law. Since we have all sinned, we deserve death. Jesus releases from releases us from that penalty. Although he had committed no crime, Jesus was executed as a criminal. In fact, it is because he was sinless that his death is an effective sacrifice for us. Jesus took our place also 
our, also took our place judicially, bearing the penalty of sin and dying in our place. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In other words, God nailed all the accusations against us to the cross. God will never see believers in Christ as deserving the death penalty, because our crimes have already been punished in the physical body of Jesus. But the penalty for sin extends beyond physical death to include spiritual separation from God. Again, Jesus took our place. Part of Christ's agony on the cross was a feeling of separation from the Father. After three hours of supernatural darkness in the land, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, we need never experience that sense of abandonment. We can never fathom how much God the Son suffered in taking our place. In order to save us, Jesus had to take our place and to die for our sins. He had to lay down his life as a sacrifice, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. His sacrifice was perfect in holiness, in worth, and in the power to save. After his resurrection, Jesus showed his scars to the apostles, and forever the marks of our Savior's suffering will be visible an eternal reminder that he took our place. The prophet Isaiah writes, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Let me give thanks for the bread. Dear Father, we thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to redeem us and to take our place in paying the penalty for our sin. Help us never to forget the price paid for our redemption was the sacrificial death of Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Help us to remember that Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us. And we also thank you for the grace given to us to believe in Christ's redemptive sacrifice for us. And now we ask that you bless us as we partake of the bread, which is the symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus, broken to save his people from their sins. In Christ's name, amen. Before we give thanks for the cup, I'm going to read a passage I did read in the lesson <clears throat> earlier, Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to begin, I'll begin with verse 8 and read through verse um, 12. <clears throat> See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy an empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In other words, He's the God-man, fully God, fully man. And in Him, you have been made complete. And He is head, that He is the head over all rule and authority, and in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in other words, a spiritual circumcision, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who, caused, who raised him from the dead." <clears throat> Paul chose the ordinances of baptism and circumcision to illustrate what Christ has done for us on the cross. 
what baptism and circumcision signify Christ accomplished for us. Circumcision, as I explained, and I'm sure you know anyway, and is the removal of the flesh. And Christ separated us from the power of the flesh, that is, the power of sin. He cut us off from it through His death. Baptism represents newness of life. Coming up out of the water pictures the rising up from death, the death that the old man suffered with Christ when he died, and the, the rising of the new man, the new woman, to new life. This is what Christ did for us at Calvary. He made us into new creatures. Justified, forgiven people, sin is paid for, its power is broken for every believer. We now have a new nature and new ability to live obediently, to live to the glory of God. Now that's what Christ accomplished for every believer through His bloody sacrifice. And that's what we remember at this time as we take the cup. And so let us remember these things. Remember what He did for us when He died in our place. A vicarious death, as Mark has reminded us. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we do thank You for His sacrifice, which cost Him His life and caused the perfect, holy, sinless Son of God to suffer hell in our place. Separation from You. We thank You for that sacrifice. Thank You for the great love that brought Him into this world to die for us. Help us to remember that and reflect deeply upon the great blessings He accomplished for us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's end with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. It's been good being with you this morning. Have a good week. And we'll see you next week. Keep your eyes on the captain of our salvation. May God help us all to do that. Goodbye.